Welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. Today's question is, how can we help more men to speak up about rape? And I'm in conversation with Ross McGill. Hi Pookie, uh, hello everyone. My name is Ross McGill. Uh, I've been a teacher in London for 25 to 30 years. I've lost count. Um, that's evolved into a blogger, stroke author, and I'm currently conducting my doctoral research at the University of Cambridge. And I'm not talking to you about any of the things that you no. usually are mostly <laughs> known for. So you're like one of the most influential teachers in the world. But I want to talk to you today about how we can help uh, men to speak up more about rape. And you really bravely blogged about this some time ago now. And I've been wanting yeah. to talk to you about it for a while. So yeah, I'm thinking about it a couple of days ago, because I think it was two summers ago that I blogged about it openly and said I was a survivor of sexual abuse. Um, and I'd gone through, well, I was actually going through the process with the police at the time, but it was, I guess part of me coming out publicly was part of my own therapy um, to be able to talk to people. You know, like being able to talk to you like this openly now is something I would never have done two years ago. And it happened to me when I was 13, so that's 35 years ago, 34, 35 years ago. Um, and it was pretty something that I'd never spoke to about anybody about other than, uh, you know, best mates, girlfriends, what, you know, my wife type stuff. Uh, and it was at that point I told my mother um, for the first time as well. So, yeah, two years ago, I think, when I, when I came out. And what inspired you to, to, you know, kind of dig into it a couple of years ago? I mean, it'd been something that had been part of your life for a very, very, very long time before you kind of came out about it? I, I think um, I know always as a teacher, having the six week summer period gave me downtime cognitively just to relax, to sleep, to eat, to see friends. But then when the days became blurred and you didn't know what day it was, you know, when, when you have a, such a long week break, you really start to switch off and relax. And it was at that point I often explored this demon and it wouldn't be other than just thinking about it or put squashing it back under the carpet but more importantly the last few years we've had a lot more stories in the press so I think specifically Chelsea Football Club Barry Bennell rings and the name rings a bell and a few others and I'd either and I think working freelance now I have a lot more time on trains to listen to the radio as I go to different jobs so I've had a lot more thinking and reflection time, more than I've ever had in my entire adult life. Um, so it's given me a lot more space to think about me professionally and personally. So I think those are the two biggest factors, plus all the news stories. And as the more people talked about it, and the more men specifically, or footballers who'd gone to clubs as kids and have been under the influence of coaches, I guess it gave me more reassurance that it wasn't just me, that it was okay to talk about it, those types of things. Uh, so that process was probably going on for about five or six years beforehand. And I knew I was getting close to a point where I was going to start to talk about it publicly. Um, yeah. And do you think it's, it's like completely leading question harder for men to talk about this than women because this is sadly an experience that you and I share but I think my take on it would be it's easier for me to stand up and say you know well, this happens I think to me. it's hard for everyone full stop but the research I've at least um, picked for my area is that men don't speak up um you know, I remember when I disclosed online, what one thing I hadn't anticipated was the flurry of responses privately uh, with other people disclosing to me. And, you know, I wasn't ready for that. Uh, you know, and I had one or two people come to my aid quickly and, and say, sign, you know, don't try to solve theirs, just signpost them to people and, you know, be a be. I guess a signal or a beacon that you can do it and use my example more my example so yeah I, I signed you know I was for my my issue I I, I was uh, I got a lot of responses from uh, men uh, I think one man stood out probably 50 60 years he's kept silent wow. and he just wanted to say it to me privately and then I, I got a 
I, I think I've got the recording somewhere on my laptop. Um, a, a lady got in touch. She was in tears on a voicemail and said, my son's just spoken to me. He's, he's reads your blog. He's a teacher, etc." He's just disclosed and it was uh, her husband, his father. So, you know, it was a wide range of stuff that I got, you know, and, and women getting in touch with me with horrific stories uh, in comparison to my experiences. Um, so, yeah, that was one thing I hadn't prepared for, um, the, the flurry of responses. But you can see how the ripple effect of speaking out gives other people confidence to either speak out themselves or to know that, whether they're not ready to deal with it, that there are other people who've gone through the, the same scenarios. So when you did decide to speak out about it, then you weren't, I kind of assumed you partly did it knowing that that would give people the space to talk their own truth and, you know, set, set that path. Well, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't, I had so many things going on in my head, Cookie. Um, I think when I, I'm trying to rewind now, I think when I blogged, I'd already gone through my telling my family. I kind of had a little roadmap in my head of consequences, but actually I had so many occasions where I was going to speak to my mother about it for the last 10 years, you know, a little walk around the park together, but I never did it. And there was a funny, it was a bit of a funny situation that actually made me do it. But uh, when I spoke to my mother, then I told my three brothers and extended family. And then I, I blogged about it and I think I've shared it a couple of times on my personal and professional Twitter and on the blog. And I've not, and, I, on, and actually on my personal Facebook, but I've never really gone back to it. And I've, I might tweet it out, having I had just spoken to you today about it as a kind of annual thing. But I know it's an important signpost for people, but I hadn't really thought about everyone else. I was too busy dealing with myself. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I was going through the police investigation process. So I had to be quite cautious, I guess of saying too much, um, what I could say, what I couldn't say, I wasn't, I wasn't really sure. So I didn't want to put the investigation at risk, I suppose, not really knowing what would happen. Has that investigation concluded now? Yeah, it, it, it concluded. It probably took um, three or, in fact, I can't remember. Anything between three months to a year, I think the process took. Yeah. And what did your mum say? It sounds like it was really tough uh, to. to um, it was. It, I'd wildly overestimated it, just like you know most loving mums would do. You should have told me years ago. We would have dealt with it there and then. Give me a cut, all that type of stuff. And then I think once that shock was over, over the next day, week, month or so, it was more kind of digging deep questions. And when I said I was going to the police. My mother did what she could to, to help and dig out any bits of evidence. Um, but yeah, the actual, so I'd gone, I think my uh, niece was having a christening for her young son. So I'd gone up, I'd traveled from London up north where I am now to uh, attend a, a christening party. Um, and I was staying with my brother and sister-in-law and I'd parked my car on their street overnight and my car was stolen uh, oh, i remember your car being stolen overnight so because i woke up frustrated not only that all our belongings inside the car was gone and for a weekend and my son's trumpet and things like that and the car was stolen that i'd also gone to th up for the christian to pull my mum to one side because i was at this process with the police and stuff where it was brewing and i needed to say something soon because i also thought in a few months, I might want to write about it as part of my own therapy. Um, so the car being stolen really affected the morning for me personally on the day of the family event. And be, I think I was about 20, 30 minutes away from where the event was, from where we were staying. So long story short, I had to get a hire car, but the hire car would only deliver to where my mo mother lived, coincidentally, to where I was located for the for where we were staying for the weekend. So I had to get a taxi uh, from Halifax to Rochdale and I found myself and my mum for a, an hour or so while I was waiting for the car to, uh, the, uh, what's it called, the hire car yeah. to be uh, shipped to us. And uh, 
with the frustration of the car being stolen, I thought, right, now is it. And I said, Mum, I've got to tell you something. And I spat it out. And that was it. And, I f I, yeah, a huge weight off my shoulders. Uh, I, you know, I should have told my mum one 30 years ago. Why didn't you? Um, well, well, I was only 13, so I, had, I, wouldn't, I wasn't a very confident child. I moved to seven state school, uh, different schools in my family. Um, I was always a shy kid anyway, but I think moving probably made me shyer than normal. Um, I wouldn't say I was a very articulate soul. And I guess like anything, you don't know if it's right or wrong. You, you then question, was it yourself? Did you lead the person on? Um, and then after the event's gone, I guess you go a bit numb to it. And, you know, every, everyone's different. Every scenario, family's different. Although we were a loving family and, you know, very warm and giving and loving and stuff, I, don't, I just don't know if I had the capacity to express it, I think. And... I then didn't really deal with it until um, my first relationship when I was 18 or 19. And then, you know, without getting too embarrassing, started to have one or two problems in the bedroom and started to identify what might have been the reasons for that. And I think I would have associated the, the abuse to it. So then, you know, relation, key relationships, close relationships, I'd kind of disclose but by then it had happened and I still wasn't aware of what I should have done and no one ever ever said why did you say xyz or that I can remember so I guess it just became part of what happened in my life and, and that was it and moving to different places I guess I was never really reminded of the location or the event itself and I remember just two or three times in my adult life going back to this particular location just through uh, one holiday to work and whatever else and thinking oh that happened I need to deal with that and as you get a bit more wiser you know I guess in my 30s and 40s think right that was wrong I need to let the police know um, but in my 20s I probably uh, blurred it out as I was trying to identify myself as who I am as a young man growing up breaking away from family going to university that type of stuff that we all do then in my 30s I, I guess I probably blurred it out through alcohol, you know, drinking, uh, things like that. And I guess now having my family, my own child and, and, you know, home and stuff like that, being a bit more stable, settled, you know, aware of our mental health, seeing everyone else talk about these things, you know, through the world of social media and things, bringing us all closer together. I guess my late 30s, early 40s really has put me in a very strong position to be able to talk about it or have no excuse not to, just whether I chose to or not. Um, so, yeah, here we are. I'm 46 now. So uh, 33, but of maths, 33 years later. Did you worry what people would think? Yeah, of course. You know, the whole range of did you lead the person on? you're dirty, what's wrong with you? Oh, that's why you've got one or two issues, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or, or why you're a bit weird or whatever. Um, you know, from all comments from your mates to school kids that I work with, you know, you get one or two kids, you can't, not every child can like you. So if they say something and you think, oh, so you're weird, you kind of think, well, is that because of the event that happened to me that makes me a particular character? Um, so you're always self-analyzing and doubting your ability your character and trying to attribute it to this event that you've got locked deep in your psyche that's a demon that you need to resolve but um in 20 years ago some of like that i was you know a weary teacher not feeling very well during the kind of winter season going in for a checkup for a cold or tonsillitis and in their um, toilets, the male toilets, there was a poster with a, a green badge. I'm sure you've seen it, the We See You badge by Survivors UK. And for me, that was a beacon of light moment because it first exposed me to a community of men who had been abused, raped and everything else. And uh, 
I didn't do anything about it. I think I might have wrote the website. I made a note, and this was before mobile phones. Um, but I remember the badge and the colour. And then I think I saw it two or three times again throughout the next 10, 15 years. And then I think um, as I started to get active on social media, I probably came across their account or started to do my own investigations and hashtags and what have you. And uh, I just touched base for them, and I think I must have reached out. And then I got... They posted me a little green lapel badge and that also part of my own process was to put it on my jacket for two reasons. One, it was a badge that really meant something to me, the first badge in my life. You know, we've all wore um, a poppy, the AIDS badge, you know, all sorts of things. And of course they make a difference and mean things. But when you find something that really, uh, it's the only thing that I think in my life that's made, a, made really meant something that I wore on my lapel. Um, and on saying that out aloud, I need to bloody uh, wear it all the time. Excuse my language. Um, I need to wear it all the time. Um, so I take it on and off, but I know when I first wore it, I also knew that someone one day would ask me what it was for. And I had to be prepared for that moment. And, and funny enough, it came. <laughs> but I think I managed to get out and about around the streets of London and no one said a thing and I wouldn't expect anyone to do it. And I think I passed one or, one or two people wearing them once as well. Um, but the funny thing is I was just about to leave home and my wife had one of her friends around oh, from the school run. And she, she just said, what's that? And I had to respond and say it out aloud in front of my wife as well for the first time to anybody and it was a real moment um but i did it and i, I said it to someone else out aloud i guess it was a bit of a shock to them but i managed to kind of articulate what the badge was for with the kind of undercurrent that it was representing me and my own experience without having to go into details and I can't remember how the conversation ended, but literally I kind of grabbed my bag and off I went on the tube to my next job. But it was, uh, that was also a landmark moment for me to, to be able to talk to someone totally new about it. And then I went to one or two events, I think Teaching Awards also down in London, where I wore it. And I, I remember someone else in a group, actually, this was a group version. Uh, I was talking about Teaching Awards and the winners and, you know, I was being a judge. And then someone joined the group and said, oh, what's that badge? And I had to then say it publicly to about 10 people. So there was the whole, it's learning to deal, I guess it was learning to deal with when and when not to say it, what to say and what not to say, and to also gauge everyone else's response. You don't want to create shock on other people, but you also want the badges there to raise awareness and to also bust the stereotype that a six foot four inch male, very successful in the, teaching community has also gone through this experience so i i bust your myths and perceptions about a strong white male what do you think would enable more people to to speak up because it seems from what you said that when you were first open about it that you had lots of people who confided in you and that was perhaps the first time they told anyone what what might make a difference there do you think is it more people being brave like you to talk about it? I think it definitely helps. You know, I, I, I think the stories, the reporting on the news, but, you know, being given the time and the day to listen to those news reports help. You know, back in my working life as a teacher, full-on 60-hour weeks, rarely do I get a chance to buy a book of stamps and listen to the news, never mind talk about my demons. So, Everyone's got their own different circumstances and scenarios and time of their life when they can talk about stuff. But you, you see all the different stories on social media, you know, Black Lives Matters and everything else. And I think a lot of us take reassurance from other people who are of similar highs and lows in our lives as a, as a kind of marker or indicator that it's okay, we need to talk about it for whatever, for whatever, whatever it is. And I think... We can, we can never talk about anything enough in terms of, you know, adversity and minorities and people that are victim to war and whatever else. Um, so I'd, I'd, the answer is yes. Uh, how? I guess through news reports, stories, Joe blogs, people like myself talking about it. Um, and, and people just going out of their way to rather than just me always 
promote my blogs and my resources, go out of my way to share other people's stories sometimes, particularly when, given my audience and the amount of people that I follow. Occasionally, rather than just tweeting about teaching, just share someone's story. But uh, the challenge for us all is we're consumed with so much content now, a lot of it becomes a bit noisy, so it's very hard to be heard and, and filter important messages. But um, uh, there's a lot of companies out there that can help. So Survivors UK was in my case, and I'm sure there's others. And Survivors UK is a London-based um, kind of organization for men, victims of abuse. I, I still don't know who the version is for men across the country. I'm sure there's a name or something I've forgotten about, but I think there's a need for that, particularly in my case and others. Um, you know, more funding and stuff like that. But, you know, we all, we, we fund, you know, given the virus now and two trillion pounds of debt and all the other f issues we have to face, it's just, you know, there's, there's children in need, there's people without food. It's all, everything's a priority, isn't it? Yeah, it's a challenge, isn't it? What, do you think there's a role for, for schools? I mean, in terms of creating an environment where if this has happened to, to one of their pupils that they can go and talk to someone, seek some help? Well, the interesting thing I wrote on my blog when I talked about it, the, the I'd organised a safeguarding event and I was sitting next to a teacher who I line managed and the lady in the room, uh, the safeguarding lead said, there'll be someone in this room, a teacher who will have been sexually abused or raped and the the person next to me went yeah right under his breath and i kind of wanted as a school leader i should have pulled him out on it but because he was also my line manager and i hadn't yet dealt with my own it i i, I stopped myself and i i never lived that moment down personally and professionally because i'd let I, i've let that person's myth perpetuate as a school leader number one uh, in terms of calling it out and two personally not dealing with it myself it's just like you'd see you know a, a racism comment that time so I feel very disappointed with myself at that moment but I wrote about it and thought well if we've got teachers in our system with those types of views for whatever it is you know racism sexual abuse what have you or even men being raped or sexually abused which people you know all the myths between men and women and men on men and women and uh, women etc um we've got a lot of work to do so safeguarding is always a top priority for schools particularly with children but there are lots of issues you'll be very surprised i mean you won't be but some listeners might be um there are a lot of issues within the staff profession itself you know a lot of issues that schools have to resolve with the colleagues that they employ uh sometimes between colleagues uh, never mind colleagues with um historical events that they might emerge during their career within that within that school or college um but i think with as ever as, as, as schools do you know good work in terms of helping kids navigate their way in the world you know condoms all those types of things that we do with sex education but exposing kids delicately to other things that they may not believe to exist you know, man on man, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, busting a few perceptions, but it's a delicate fit, fine line as to as and when. And then you've also, also got the parents to consider about what should and shouldn't be taught in schools and all those types of things. But safeguarding, absolutely number one priority. And do you think it is always the right thing for someone to speak out if something like this has happened to them? Or do you think there is a, a time when you might not? Um, probably yes and no, I guess, is a an quick answer to the question. Um, you know, what, what's the event? Is it under investigation? What can you say publicly? What can't to put the investigation at risk? Does it put the individual in danger? There's so many scenarios. Um, I, I guess if I just talk about my own experience, I was ready to talk about it. It's what's frustrating, you know, think of comments from Boris Johnson or even people that I've spoken to. Why wait 33 years? 
at, it's because everyone takes a certain time to process. And of course you've got, you know, episodic memory where it might fade over time, the evidence disappears, all that type of stuff. And then you've got, am I telling the truth? You know, mm. and all sorts. So you got all that to deal with as well. But I think you have to respect the person, whatever time of their life they decide to, dis to disclose. You know, we all have mental health. We all have different ways of processing things, articulating things. And I, I'm an eloquent, well-educated man. You know, if I had ADHD or I couldn't speak or was deaf or, and the same thing happened, then it's going to be even more of a challenge. And I'm sure there are a lot of people out there with those circumstances. So I think, you know, the likes to uh, people listening, myself, who are can tune into a podcast and has got a reliable Wi-Fi connection and can put two words together compared to those vulnerable kids or adults out there living in poverty where those things may be happening and they do not have that network or that cultural capital to be able to talk about it. Those are the people, you know, we need to help everyone who are victims of sexual abuse and rape, but those, those should be our priority. And I know the government have got an industry of experts and systems in place, but there's never enough of everything, as I said earlier about funding. But um, I don't know if that's answered the question or not, but um, I guess every situation has to be taken on an individual basis, individual context, that there's the law that has to apply. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think it has to be adapted to suit uh, the context of the individual and the circumstance, I suppose. Was it a hard decision for you to go to the police about it because I say that's one way in which our stories really differ my uh, therapist encouraged me to um, go to the police although it was many 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 years hence because uh, I'm pretty sure I could track down the man who raped me um, but it wasn't something I felt in any way able to do and I carry quite a lot of guilt because there's always that fear well what if he went and did it again or you know that well I, I knew part of my little kind of pipeline of therapy process was that there was a slim chance that they would ever find him uh, or that anything would be done because there was no evidence other than me and him in a room. Um, you know, no other evidence, you know, my clothes and DNA and whatever else all gone. Um, so I knew the chance was slim, but I knew... I re also another episode was looking through my mother's photographs. I remember seeing a photograph of him and think that is him and my heart sank when I saw it. So I, I made a log of the photograph where it was. And at some point I mentioned to my mother, who's this and X, Y, Z and a name. Cause I had a name in my head, but it was totally a different name. And I think to this day, I think the police spoke to my wife. I don't know the person's name. I actually got the name wrong. I'd given them a nickname. Um, but just part of my own healing, I didn't want to know the real name because I just didn't want to do anything silly um, on the internet or anything like that. Um, but I part of the pipeline was to report it to the police just in case they could connect their place of work because I knew where, what that was. I knew the time roughly uh, within a year and that there was a chance that they could search some databases of employment um you know age group male that type of stuff so they they did find him but my method was simply if i could give him one uncomfortable night's sleep knowing that the police had knocked their door with this accusation and that i had reported it more importantly i would go to my grave a happier man because my father died in 2004 and I regret never telling him when it happened or telling him before he passed away. And plus I wasn't at his deathbed when he's passed away. So I was adamant also to make sure that my mother knew and uh, she's 75. But because the interesting thing about my story was that my, where I lived was a, an annex or a building in the Salvation Army on a location of a homeless hostel or a children's home or a, a fisherman's hostel type thing. So it, as I would come home, I'd go through the entrance up the building into our house, which was secure. But you think of all the safeguarding risks and DBS checks that we have today, 
I know that I am not the only person, child, dare I say within the Salvation Army, who's been susceptible to this, which is quite horrific, really. But I'm sure there's a lot of more, you know, you hear a lot of cases of 70s and 80s emerging because social media, people see each other, plus we people are of a certain age get to a place where intellectually they have the, now the capacity to have processed it and now talk about it and have the the blogging platform to have their story shared. Uh, so I do think there's a certain era on a generation that can now speak out. Um, but going back to my point about the police, I just wanted to have it logged and I didn't want my mother and father, more importantly, to blame themselves for it happening to me under their nose. So it was the classic, although he wasn't a friend of the family or anything, he was an employee under my father of the Salvation Army on a location where we lived and worked. And I know if I was a father, I would have blamed myself yeah. for not being a m more aware or savvy because we had loads of Saturday jobs, you know, from milking the goats to mucking out the cow pigs to painting and decorating to cleaning out the toilets. I used to do all these types of things before I went off to university. Um, so, so that was another big reason for not telling my parents. And also when I did tell my mother, not making sure that she didn't blame herself for it happening. And did it, did it feel like the right thing once you'd kind of gone to the police and it, it must've been quite difficult going through that process of- Oh yeah, interview. I mean, I had to go through it all again. It was a lot more rigorous. Yeah. Um, under camera surveillance interviews, all sorts of things at times when you didn't want to do it. So they said, you know, interviewing here at this time on the, with this camera and these two people, you need to come next week. So whether you're ready or not, you had to do it. Um, so, so there was all that and obviously fitting that in as a freelancer, you know, you work as and when you've got a job trying to fit that into appointments and not making an income was also a bit of a challenge, but if you go to my pinned tweet on at Ross McGill, I think I've tried to reply historically as and when different events happened. Mm. Um, just so I had a mental record of what was going on as and when I was dealing with it or when I was having a bad day or things like that. So. And did you go to therapy as well? Or because you kind of refer to this as your kind of therapeutic process, but did you did you actually get I haven't. Therapy? I've been offered it. A lot of people have said. Um I think I've talked about it personally to myself, to my wife, to others now. And I see that and writing, and I see that as my therapy, even though I would I know I would benefit from a professional therapist. But I, I also know that I don't need it. I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm in denial. Um, I feel much happier in my life. I feel that I've said what I need to say. I've done what I need to do. I um, mentally feel stable. I healthy diet. I drink moderately. Um, you know, trying to analyze all my own influences and factors and scenarios as to am I doing okay but that's not to say in five ten years or if something serious happens in my life health or a bereavement that i might not go off the rails but it's a yes and a no answer <laughs> that's fair enough and, and i think the thing with with all of this really is that i think we're never kind of we're always on a journey aren't we i guess and that's it you've done your police investigation i've done a lot of therapy and yet there's still that uncomfortableness, I think, for both of us. I don't think either of us could just sit here and, and tell the story of what happened to us without it evoking something really deep and difficult. Um, yeah. do you, sorry, go. Um, you know, I, I, I know once, or you know, if I think about my father occasionally, I'd break down in tears or um, there, was a, there was supposed to be a kind of teacher event for male mental health about I think last summer and sadly no one signed up for the tickets which also indicates that either people aren't interested in male mental health you know parting with their money or people don't want to go to that event because we've got two or three 
really important male speakers in the education sector plus me to talk about and this was also where our part of my healing process was a year later yeah to talk about this publicly and i know when i've um trying to think of the events where i might have said it in conversation and i've definitely said at keynotes or train events where I've dealt with my own mental health and I've left it woolly like that. Yeah. Where people that know will know what I mean, whereas other people might not or can go off and investigate. But um, I've, I've said that in that kind of way, um, I guess. And do you, you said before that you had, you know, n now you kind of look at yourself and, and you feel you're in a, you're in a good place, you're in a healthy place, but that um, you had historically kind of numbed it through alcohol or, or, or other things. Are you happy to talk about that a little bit? That's, yeah, I can. So, um, Freddie, give you 10 more minutes and then we'll go to the park. I'm going to take them to a new local park. Uh, you'll have to say that question again if you recall. Uh, sorry, I was just saying that you'd mentioned before that you had in the past kind of tried to numb this through alcohol or, or other means. Well, I think looking back, I, I, numbing probably the right word, but I, I think a mixture of reasons, Salvation Army background, Christian, no exposure to drugs and alcohol, arriving from, you know, North England to South East London in the 90s was pretty hardcore stuff, you know, I remember having the rip taken out of me for wearing, well, wearing a Blackpool Football Club t-shirt, you get the rip taken out of me any time. But I think in terms of fashion, mm. moving to South East London, you know, near Camden Market, that type of stuff, um, I, I was quite naive. Um, and I think also moving to London gave me a bit more, I, I, I also interestingly moving to the furthest part away from home, I was probably desperate either to find my own identity away from the Salvation Army. And I managed to stay away from drugs and alcohol for two or three years of university. So I was on a four year B.Ed. Uh, so in the fourth year, um, even though I didn't need a student loan, I took one out to get a bit of finance. And I guess it was beer money, people call it, don't they? <laughs> um, so I had a good last year. Um, and then the football team were finally quite happy if I had a pint here or there. But I guess throughout the, you know, on an NQT salary in London, there wasn't much left to buy a loaf of bread, never mind buy a pint of beer. Um, but in my 30s, I suppose, when I started to earn a bit more as a middle leader and have a bit of more disposable income, that's probably where I started to go out and enjoy myself on a Saturday. And we'd, I'd go out clubbing with my mates, or we would start to maybe drink a little bit too more, much more than needed. And then I guess where, I'm not saying I had any hallucinations or anything, but when you start to experience being very drunk and you've never really had those sensations before, I'm not saying you hallucinate, but certainly when you're drunk, you certainly think in a different way um, and behave. And if you're on your own, and I, you know, all my family's been up north for 30 years, so when you're living in a bed sit or a, a, a one bed flat on your own, you know, trying to establish some relationships or a family but you know single on and off for a long time um into my early 30s so it was a good 10-15 years of being a singleton bachelor in london and and then starting to earn a good salary so you would go out with your mates because you're you're out on the look you know all those types of things and you pick up a drink here or there um you know and drinking alcohol also ties in with your mood or, and you know being a teacher exhausted working 60 hour weeks if you're not also eating during the day proper meals and you're going out on a friday night and drinking many many pints of beer you can see how it starts to really affect your health and your mental health and then if that becomes a routine it's a habit then isn't it if you're doing it every week and i did probably for about five or ten years um I'll probably define myself as a binge drinker um, where I wouldn't touch anything during the working week, plus also working in a DT workshop where if you're cutting wood in front of children on a bandsaw, one little slip of the finger hung over, um, there goes your finger. So there was a bit of a risk as a DT teacher 
going to work with a hangover, being a middle, being a head of department responsible for other teachers, you know, all those types of things. I'm not saying I did anything foolish, but all those thoughts go through your mind. Um, and I don't think I've done anything. Um, trying to think of a word that would uh, against the law. Mm -hmm. um, but I've done what most young people would do that want to have a play around with alcohol and a party and things like that. But I would say late twenties, early thirties, there was a danger where I was probably numbing the pain of either dealing with my loneliness in terms of relationships and my past and just living, trying to live and survive in London and get some sense of family and home. Yeah. But things are a lot better now. Yeah, things are, uh, and it's hard work and it's, you know, it's, it's just like, like the blog and podcasts or whatever, it's constant investment. So, you know, I'm a bit wiser now and I think all the advice I've been given to myself throughout the years about relationships, having, having a, someone that loves you and a child and, you know, cat and dog and stuff, one, it's expensive, so you've got to work to have these things, but <laughs> um, you invest in your relationships. How are you? Cuddle, kiss every day. These things make a big difference to a successful home environment. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think how best to articulate it. It's, it's you've got to look long term. You know, it, it's one silly mistake that I make, whether you know, God forbid that I turn around and slap my wife in the face or I do something silly on a night out. It's all destroyed in seconds. So you've got to, you know, I've come this far. I'm not going to let it go. Um, but, you know, life gets in the way. Car crashes, bereavements, fires, whatever else. Pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> and there. Uh, you know, things get in the way and make people make silly decisions. And if you've got a bit of history and some mental health going, uh, things to resolve, it can throw you off the rails at any time and then distort your family. You know, whether your family distorts you or your you distort the family. Um, so I, I treat, I shouldn't say I treat, but I, I look at my family and my circumstances I have at home, the same as I approach my blogging and my, my, my business is that, when people ask you, how did you establish Teacher Toolkit? Well, I say I'm constantly tinkering the website every day or a tweet or a blog. And although I haven't blogged or written anything for four weeks and I'm taking time off, I guess I'm investing in the 12 years work where I have. Whereas on a Saturday night in my late 30s and 40s, instead of going to the pub on a Saturday night, I was blogging. Uh, and I've done that for the last 12 years. Uh, so that's now where I'm reaping that reward. So it's the same with family and relationships. You have to invest every day continually, uh, uh, consistently, consistently to, to be able to reap the benefits. And it's something that you need to constantly top up. So it's like all of us when we live to live, learn, uh, listen to our grandparents' stories and words of wisdom, how do you live so long, drink one glass of red wine a day, that type of stuff. <laughs> um, whether they're myths or facts, um, you know, cons consistent investment in the things that are important to you, I think, add up. And I think also, I think back to this particular topic, I think the constant reminders, whether I wanted them or not, whether it's something in the news, someone someone said, something I've read, it's that constant reminder that I, there's a demon here I need to resolve. And I probably th have many people to thank or my circumstances or my own hard work and resilience that I've had the capacity in the mental space to be able to deal with it. Yeah. And I guess I also have to thank my family, my parents who, you know, working class background, etc., have given me, you know, the important things in life to be able to reflect and to talk and to be polite and say, thank you to get to a position where I have the mental awareness and the reflection to be able to deal with it yeah. without breaking down or not being able to, like I mentioned earlier, someone with some learning difficulties or people, not, not the network around me to be able to deal with it. And have you been able to come to a place of forgiveness of the man who raped you? That's a good question. I haven't never thought about that. Um, 
the answer is no. I'm not. I've not. I've not got to that point. So I'll probably reflect on that question after we finish the podcast. But um, I don't know what I would do and what I would say. You have to come back to me for that one. Um, you know, I've been grown up to forgive people. I know when I see anything on the news, particularly within the teaching profession, my immediate reaction is filth, kind of lock them up type stuff, which is not helpful. I know, but I find it so. What's you know, everything moves inside of me when. I hear a story of someone abusing a child. And um, I think I'm not yet in that position where I can forgive or be compassionate about people that do that to young people. Your little boy wants to go to the park. So is there a thought that you'd like to leave people with? I I guess just make, uh, when you're ready, take time to talk to people would be, um, you know, at least... Uh, can you talk to yourself I suppose um but it's a it's a tough one that um because everyone's got their own circumstances and stories but um I I guess there's find there'll be one person it's about finding the right person who's willing to listen and give you that advice and it doesn't necessarily I believe have to be a qualified professional I think that might come a bit later but that good friend or that listening ear or often someone that you don't know, like you go to a conference and you end up talking to a total stranger about your deepest and darkest issues. That's just a great place to have a sounding board. And I think those things help. Um, so although I've never gone to a kind of an event that's aligned with this particular topic, I've always gone to teacher type conferences, but there's certain people you're drawn to and you start ending up having a really deep and meaningful conversation where you think, well, where did that come from out of nowhere within five minutes? So you make very important connections with people, and we all do. So you find the right people that you can talk about certain issues with. So I guess that would be my advice, is talk, talk to the right people when it's, when it's the time. Mm-hmm.